This week I'm joined by Dr. Nick Monk, who is Director of the Centre for Transformative Teaching at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. In this episode, we discuss his book, True and Living Prophet of Destruction, Cormac McCarthy and Modernity, alongside discussions on nihilism and morality. I'd like to say a big thank you to all my paying patrons and subscribers for making all of this work possible. And if you'd like to support the podcast and keep everything running as it runs on donations and patrons alone, then please find links in the description below. Otherwise, please enjoy. So, Nicholas Monk, thanks very much for joining us on Hermetics Podcast. We are going to be discussing uh, a book that you published in 2016, I believe. This is by University of New Mexico Press called... True and Living Prophet of Destruction, Cormac McCarthy and Modernity, which not only is it a beautiful edition, but it's also one of the best titles for a book, I think, you know, that, that could be. And as listeners will imagine, this is a uh, commentary, a secondary work on the work of Cormac McCarthy, which is detailing uh, what role modernity, technology, um, in industrial society plays within McCarthy's work. And this, of course, draws us into questions of whether or not there's, you know, is there meaning? Is there these value systems? Where is characters really going? And in a sense, what actually is the prior, who, you know, who is the primary agency who is talking throughout McCarthy's books? Um, but yeah, before we jump in with your book, just tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, what it is you do. Thank you very much, James, for that introduction. I, I really appreciate it and your kind words about um, about my book. Presently, uh, I work at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, uh, where I run the Teaching and Learning Centre. Um, however, I'm an honorary professor in the Department of English there, uh, and I continue to maintain an interest in uh, literary studies and the pedagogy thereof. Uh, prior to that, I was at the University of Warwick in England. Uh, my background, um, my academic background is in uh, England um, and literary studies, although uh, part of my Education was undertaken in Rutgers, New Jersey, uh, in the early two thousands. So that's the the brief history. Mm -hmm. What years were you at Warwick? I, I was there um, as a um, student um, from nineteen ninety eight to ninety nine, mm -hmm. and as a member of the faculty from two thousand and six through to two thousand and sixteen. See, might be something. There's a couple of couple of people I know who were there at that time. I might mention, oh, yeah. them. Might mention them after after we after we sure. uh, finish our discussion. Oh, but that's interesting. Yeah. There's a lot of people who pass through Warwick. You know, it's a pretty. Yeah. It's still, this sort of uh, still got that that reputation of being pretty on the edge of things. I think. Yes, it's a kind of clearinghouse for intellectuals, even at that time. You know, people with um, very interesting ideas pass through in all kinds of fits. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, yeah, but I mean, before we, we dive in sort of and get neck deep in the murky waters of McCarthy and probably what might turn out to be a fairly bleak and haggard discussion, <laughs> I have to ask you the hermetics question. You can place three thinkers, living or dead, into a room and listen in on the conversation. And uh, Cormac McCarthy is already in the room waiting. But as we were talking about before we started, I mean, I can't imagine he's probably going to say much to these three anyway. <laughs> right. Well, that's a, that's a, that's a major um, uh, challenge and um, would intimidate me massively, I have to say, James, which with, um, with McCarthy sitting there with me. I would go with... Uh, because I would want him to be uh, um, listening to the um, to the developing areas of um, of McCarthy's thinking. Uh, I would want somebody um, uh, a physicist, let's say Oppenheimer, to be present in that room. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's a lot of connections between McCarthy's thinking, um, physics, and the whole construction of those uh, those atomic tests in the desert um, in New Mexico. So uh, that for that reason. Um, and I think I would also go with the Buddha because McCarthy's an intensely spiritual person, even though that is often unfocused and certainly doesn't follow any particular um, tradition. Mm -hmm. And who would be the third or is that the full room? That's 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 the room. If you've got mm. McCarthy and the okay. other two, then okay. I think you've probably got the basic. I, one one thing I'm interested in there. I mean, I think it covers it covers a lot because I think I don't know if you happen to watch the recent interview with Lawrence Krauss with McCarthy, and he says this peculiar line, which is probably going to haunt me when I'm figuring out his work. And he says, 
I'm pretty much a materialist. Right. And he's not a man to mince words, right? right? So that that just that addition yeah. of pretty much, I thought, God, you right. know, you're, you're never going to let us know. So, you, but you <laughs> said there he's intensely spiritual. Yes. And now I, you know, ask you the horrible question, I guess, that many people are trying to figure out. In what sense do you think he's spiritual? What do you think his spirituality <laughs> revolves around? I think I came to that, uh, James, um, and I think your insights are really, um, really good one there. And, and picking up on that particular um, remark is key. Uh, I came to this by thinking through um, his approach to modernity, and I started to think through: well, what does he place in opposition to modernity? Because you, you know, it doesn't exist in a vacuum here. Um, modernity needs to, um, for the dialectic, its own dialectic to function, needs to have its opposite in order to draw it into the um, into the larger process. And, and what he places uh, against modernity is the natural world um, and the ineffability of that natural world. So it, there's a very diffuse spirituality that comes through the um, existence of animals, um, the uh, the landscapes themselves. Um, there's that kind of there's that line from um, uh, Blood Meridian about optical democracy, where there's a kind of equality between a rock, a human being, and any other species of um, animal on the planet, um, or any any sorry any species any substance on the planet indeed, and and that gives us an insight into. Uh, into the way there's a world in McCarthy that's infused with emotive power that has the potential to resist modernity. Mm. Do you think? Do you think um, the resistance against modernity is something that can actually be achieved for from a full well, theory? No, I think, I think he's pessimistic about that. <laughs> very often um, what happens is that this gets just simply mowed under the machinery of uh, modernity as it proceeds um, on its journey and, and I think the conclusion of that journey is the road I think that's modernity's end point in McCarthy uh, in many ways and uh, once that novel's done uh, in many ways that I think the subject is done in, in, in those kinds of particulars But uh, it's peculiar, do you find the end of the road hopeful however even though you know often it's repeated that it's you know his bleakest book um yeah and it's probably like his sort of i don't mean this in derogatory way i think it's his simplest book as well in the sense yeah. of this is just how things are there isn't necessarily as deep a complexity as blood meridian um but the end i always found to be oddly hopeful but i'm not sure for who or what yeah i think i think that's a great point and and um and I think one of the uh, – you can read that a number of ways. Uh, I'd, I think it jars with the rest of the novel. I think the way that the, the boy is kind of handed off to these almost Messiah-like uh, new parents is, um, it, you know, it doesn't sit well with the with the destruction that we've seen come before and um, the end point of modernity as I characterise it. Um, I think I've heard it theorised that that's in there because at the time he wrote The Road, he had a very young son, McCarthy, and that he couldn't bring himself to follow completely through um, to where that novel implies he should have followed all the way through to. So I find it, um, it's almost like a... Um, it's jarring. I think it's an, uh, not consistent with the rest of his work and therefore I don't find it very convincing. <laughs> I'm in agreement with you. I mean, would you would you say that it's probably his weakest work? Yeah, I do. I think it. I, I think the end betrays it. I think there's some beautiful writing in there. I think there's some magnificent stuff. You know, when he talks about the the trout, um, you know, with their vermiculate patterns in the in the pools of the Appalachians, as I think we're supposed to envisage them. Uh, that's that's glorious. But I think I, I think the rest of it's a bit mechanical, um, and I think it. Um, I think it struggles with itself a bit, um, and as is manifested in that in that very unsatisfactory ending. Mm. That's interesting. So there's a time you almost see McCarthy as making a slip up there in terms of he just couldn't he couldn't bring himself in the face of his own son to bring his own what he knows to be probably the truth to conclusion. Now that would bring the question forward of. What is the conclusion for McCarthy in most of his works? What are these two things that it's modernity, as you said, and nature, but it seems uh, not really either one of them wins, but you, you, but and then neither one of them wins, and then the characters get lost, and that's usually the ending of most of these things. Right, I, I think that's a great point, and I think 
I think you're right. In your, I think your question contains the answer, really, in that in the, nobody wins. <laughs> if you look at um, if you look at um, if you look at Blood Meridian, it's uh, it's too historically early to tell who wins that one. Um, you know, we we have this um, this developing and uh, massively powerful first force of modernity represented by Judge Holden sweeping across that continent. Mm -hmm. But at the end of that book, it's not clear to us um, where that struggle might go. You know, the landscapes remain the landscapes. You can't, you can't um, tear down a mountain um, overnight. Uh, there's, this is a long process. And I also think in, in those novels, um, in the Western novels, there's a, a constant reference to geological time as the antidote to modernity. So the fact is that um, humanity and all its devices all perish in the in, in the almost endless uh, well of time that faces us in the future. And therefore, McCarthy doesn't commit himself to a defeat or a victory on either side. I don't think he feels he has to. And you, in your in your book, you read the judge as being the basically the representative of the enlightenment and is that why you sort of say that we don't really know where that journey's right if, whether or not that journey where it finishes because we're still in the you know in contemporary society we're still in the well in in contemporary modernity we're still in the yeah. throes of the enlightenment thought yeah i think that that's exactly um, what i think about it you know for, for me holds the avatar of, of modernity he represents a and is given these words to speak that are the um, apotheosis of the of enlightenment philosophy um and yet you know he's probably the most brutal malevolent and terrifying character um in possibly the whole of 20th century fiction. And that's no accident. Mm -hmm. You know, I think for McCarthy, the Enlightenment is is exactly Adorno's version of, of no direct line from um, barbarity to civilization, but a direct line from the arrow to the atom bomb. I think that's absolutely clear in those novels. And I think it comes out um, in the subsequent subsequent Western novels as well. You know, you look at the end of um, Cities of the Plain where um, Billy Parham's huddled under that bridge and um, the atomic bomb goes off in the distance some miles away and you think, to yourself, okay, we're getting closer and closer to who's going to win here. Mm. So the enlightenment, so the enlightenment wins. But in that sense, this we've, it's odd, isn't it? Yes. We've been we've been speaking about this idea of winning and losing, and I think yeah. I think McCarthy would probably say, "Where did you come up with such a ridiculous idea?" <laughs> he might well do that. Yeah. He he might well do that in terms of the. Um, again, I would go back to the um, just the the grinding endlessness of geological time you know there's no winners and losers in that unless again you go back to that notion of the optical democracy of the rock and the human being you know there's no value associated with them um, one over the other and i think when you talk about winning and losing being ludicrous concepts in the light of that i think you're absolutely right yeah mm. but for, for our purposes i think we have to talk about it. Well, I think yeah, this is the peculiar thing, isn't it? That you're you're really presented with worlds with McCarthy before anything else. You know, if you mm -hmm. think of think of something like Sutri, I mean, you have that those pages of pages of prose before anything really gets going. So you're presented with the world, and then it's almost like, oh, well, I better put some characters into this, <laughs> right. and they're these they're these sort of. Um, they're just there to carry something else on, um, which which. I mean, it's, a, it's an odd question to ask you, actually, but ro what role do you think characters actually play in McCarthy? Because it seems to me they are, they're not afterthoughts, but they're something which is there to show something else. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I love that question. I, I, think, I think they do often, I think they're often asked to bear the weight of ideas um, in ways that cause them sometimes to teeter on the edge of collapse. Uh, I think if you if you look at um, I think a good example one of one of McCarthy's best worked out characters is John Grady Cole in All the Pretty Horses. Mm. Yet yet John Grady has to bear all this weight of um, of being the avatar of Western civilization as it moves down into a pre modern Mexico. He has to bear the weight of the hero figure, mm. um, and yet at the same time be a believable character. And I think sometimes um, I think McCarthy struggles with that because it, it, those that heavy weight doesn't allow the 
intricacies and the details and the inconsistencies of human nature to emerge fully in those characters. Mm. Um, I think that's true. I think that's less true um, in Sutri, um, mm. where you've got that extraordinary protagonist who who does have that kind of um, depth. But I think I think with the Appalachian novels, concluding with that one, don't have quite the same um, developed interest in modernity that the later that the Western novels do, in particular. And and I think modernity in those novels is is less is more of a primitive sort of um, almost tool using modernity rather than the kind of industrial level um destructive version that we see later mm-hmm. where do you see that industrial level beginning to come in i see that in blood meridian i think the the judge is the avatar the you know the the herald of that kind of modernity that we see as, as entire races are swept up in um in material gain and um economic uh, uh, economic development do you think that sort of the teleology of Holden then it, as that avatar is just sort of pure control, like for, for its own sake, if we, you know, we need to know how, how this works, we need to know where it is, what it's doing. And if we don't know that, then just eradicate it. Yeah, I do think that. I think he, I think he talks at one point about um, um, versions of humanity that grow up building with um, reeds and sticks versus those that um, grow as civilization building with stone. And he only has time for the stone builders. He doesn't. Uh, he regards everything else as lesser to that. And I think that's a clear manifestation of an impulse that existed um, throughout uh, colonial Europe, certainly. Um, in the 18th and 19th centuries, that um, that unless you civilized um, other countries, then they would continue to live in barbarism and uh, backwardness, and that's mm. Holden's view, I think. Odd, odd question, then, but do you think Holden and you know, I guess the 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 contemporary whatever the Holdens of our day might be, probably some CEO at the top of a, <laughs> right. a skyscraper, do you think they're actually ignorant of what's possessing them, and they're just sort of under orders in a way that they don't really know where they come from? Yeah, I do, James. I think um, I think one of the fascinating things about Holden is that the way McCarthy has him fully understand the mechanics of the Enlightenment and yet still buy into it, yet still um, agree with himself that it's the only way uh, for humanity to progress, um, which is a word that um, he's very fond of, and to develop um, and to overcome the barbarity of previous uh, eras. Um, so he's incredibly knowing, and I think that's one of the reasons he's so terrified. Mm-hmm. You can forgive ignorance sometimes. I yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure you can forgive Holden, though. <laughs> no, you can't. No. But then, um, but that's the odd question, isn't it? Because is there anything to forgive? Because at the beginning, there is this sort of okay. There's this will within the Glanton gang of they seem to get some thrill out of killing, and then as the book goes on. You every time they're like they met some they meet some people you you sort of be like okay they're gonna they're gonna kill them all and scalp them in the most terrific way possible right. but it's almost a matter of mechanicality as you say it's like how can I forgive this because I'm not sure there's even any agency here anymore it's just what they do it's just their place it's their lot in life in a way. Sure, I think I, I think that it's quite important actually to dis- distinguish between Holden and the Glanton gang, because mm-hmm. um, you know Holden joins the Glanton gang, but um, Glanton um, uh, fails in the end, and we see him later in that novel with his head cut off um, in a glass jar. Um, you know that's not a fate that befalls the judge, mm-hmm. and I think um, I think McCarthy makes some conscious decisions there about uh, that kind of mindless scalping barbarity for basic exchange value and something much more sophisticated in the judge that um, understands its own activity in a way that Glanton and, and his people never could. It's odd then there that, that perhaps that first Glanton style of decimation is actually quite nihilistic. They don't seem to, you know, yeah. they're doing it for no real reason. It's what they do. Whereas Holden has this sort of possession, this, this, this you know, striving forward reason to do things so you know there there it isn't nihilism that wins within mccarthy's work you know his books aren't all that nihilistic it's just that the thing which has meaning it isn't the isn't the nicest meaning that it's that it's using yeah, I think you've nailed it there. There was a lot of, in the early days of um, McCarthy scholarship, there was, this was the key 
uh, ground of debate, you know, whether McCarthy's work was nihilistic or whether it wasn't. I mean, it's all, you know, somewhat, um, you know, it feels a little old now, but it's still live in terms of the intellectual um, um, activity of the books. And, and there is nihilism in those books, but it's never allowed to be the dominant force, nor is it ever the thing that... Um, actually survives mm. um we you know um even you know much as i I'm, I'm dubious about the end of the road that is not a nihilistic book ultimately because it's redeemed in that final moment mm. uh, and i do wonder sometimes along with what i've said about mccarthy's son whether um he needed he couldn't bring himself um to move to the wholly nihilistic there which um, mm. Is where you think the novel's going um, as you get towards the final um, part of it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And we were saying before, just just so everyone who's listening knows, there probably will be p- possible spoilers for Stella Maris and uh, the passenger here. But I just want to throw in Stella Maris as as the potential end. But even that, I mean, there's still not a pure nihilism there because we see the protagonist. She is taking herself to this therapist to this counselor for some yeah. reason just for the reason of well i just needed to talk to you people for something to do so there is at least some purpose as to why she's doing these things even if the conversations themselves uh you know delve into the absolute horrible depths of this sort of materialist meaninglessness yeah i i, I think i think that's absolutely right and i think uh, i think it never it never goes um to the completely abject um, if you like it never goes to the to the absolutely uh, the outer realms of nihilism i do you know the case that people used to make is if you look at the end of blood meridian mm-hmm. well what happens in there is if you take the the kid as the kind of um representative the avatar of of every man of humanity well uh, Holden takes him into the Jakes at the end of that novel and consumes him. We don't know what happens, but you know he's consumed in that moment, um, and it's very easy to read that as a metaphor for the uh, the consumption of um, something by nothing. But I don't think it is. I think it's the consumption of um, a particular way of being in the world by an instrumental modernity. That's the that's one of the key parts of my my book you know it takes into itself in its dialectic the thing that's its opposite in order to generate further power for its engine for want of a better way of putting it mm. what's the thing it wouldn't it isn't able to take in do you think well it struggles and it, um, what modernity can't do and i think this is one what something that's beginning to be studied in the passenger Mm. is it can't deal with um i know i keep coming back to this it can't deal with geological time Mm. that's that's not consumable for modernity it's almost like modernity is too young a phenomenon to be able to grasp it um and then when you come to the passenger and i haven't fully worked this out yet in any way you have these fairly lengthy discussions of time and physics. Mm. And I wonder if what McCarthy's starting to talk about in that world uh, is the is the realm of the time of modernity. You know, what does the time of modernity look like in a philosophical sense? Um, and and does, that have, does, does that affect its behaviour or the way that we construct it in, in our thought processes? Sorry, I've gone off at a bit of a no, tangent. No, no, no. I, I like the tangent because it seems to me whether or not there's a certain... I th- McCarthy, when he's talking about physics, and especially he has this emphasis on maths, but he seems to want to take it to the point, and he focuses on these mathematicians, such as um, his name escapes me. Who is he? The protagonist is, was a student of his. Yes, I, and I can't um, remember. I'm just, but I've he, just he, read it. I can't. Yeah. But uh, the point being that at a, a certain level, maths is still this sort of quantifiable quantifiable graspable modern thing you take it a bit further only five people in the world can understand it you take it a bit further and you basically become this sort of monk you end you enter into this realm of mysticism and it almost seems to me like you've pushed the quantifiable so far you've you've entered possibly into that time where you go look we actually can't understand this anymore yeah it's going to drive you mad if you look at it Definitely, and I, I think you. I think that's a really good way to to analyze that passage. Um, it keeps reducing and reducing and reducing um, to something that's only graspable graspable by the very few. You know, and perhaps we need a new Judge Holden to be able to grasp the time of modernity. Um, I don't know uh, about that, but I do think you know it's worth 
just mentioning the biographical notes about McCarthy's time at the Santa Fe Institute, you know, where he spent most of his days um, hanging out with physicists and mathematicians. And I think that comes out very clearly. But I think what's very interesting that, as I read it, at the bottom of that discussion of physics and mathematics is the notion that none of it matters if nobody's listening. You know, so if we're not paying attention to this, it doesn't exist. It's At one point, he makes the old tree in the forest analogy. He doesn't use that particular analogy, but it's the same thing. If the, if the tree falls in the forest and there's nobody there to hear it, has it fallen at all? You know, if, if, if people are talking about string theory and making demonstrable calculations to prove its effect and nobody understands it, then does that exist at all? And, and I think his answer is probably not at that point, which is interesting to me. Mm. And at a certain point, I mean, is it even true if only... I mean, you know, it may very well be true, but it's it's true right. just by the fact of about four or five people say, yeah, we've worked out, we've done the calculations. Calculations which probably people like myself, myself and you could could never even right. approach. I would look at it um, and it, it's a, it's an alien language as far as I'm concerned, yeah. maths at that level. And it's sort of, you know, here, here's the secret, here's the material secrets of the universe. Okay, well, what do you want us to do with it? <laughs> That's right. I think that's I think that's a great point. And you know, you, you could argue, and I'm not going to here, but I can hear the nihilists arguing that um, you know, here we are again. We're full circle back to um, a notion of um, there's nothing, there's nothing, there's nothing left to understand or grasp, and um, beyond the mechanical operation of, of things that are beyond our comprehension. And you know, that's too that's too bleak for me. And I think, and I think it's too bleak for McCarthy, which is why, yeah. why he there's always these seeds of mysticism, which isn't pretty. It's yes. not a, it's not a God's, it's not a revelation, it's not the beatific vision, you know. In the, in the, in Stella Maris, all of a sudden she's talking about the, the Gnostic Gorgons who guard the gate. You think, well, hang on, yeah. where did this come from? So there's yeah. always these small seeds of enchantment but it's not a dainty enchantment it's something that you know might actually not be nice when we find it yeah i, I mean i think that's completely true and there's a you know there's a long history of it um you know it, it particularly um flowers in the in the um Border trilogy, I think, um, you know, particularly the crossing where there's a lot of um, spiritual and um, uh, philosophical um, and theosophical speculation, um, which I'm not, you know, I'm not sure that that takes us anywhere or takes us very far, but it's certainly there and it's often posited as an, uh, a kind of antidote to uh, the modernity that's uh, challenged in those novels. And um, just as, just as, um, Mexico and the Mexican way of life south of the border is 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 posited as an antidote to um, to modernity, and that's that's represented all over those novels in all kinds of um, tableau, um, which are interesting um, mm -hmm. in that respect. Mm -hmm. Do you think McCarthy necessarily thinks we need an antidote to modernity, or do you think he cares about whether or not it overtakes us? <laughs> I do think he cares about it because I don't. I, I don't think he would. I think it's. I think this um, dichotomy is what certainly drove the fiction of those years um, from Blood, Blood Meridian through the Border Trilogy. I think that was the the engine of uh, uh, the philosophical engine of those novels, and I think he he must have some at least suspicion or inkling that there's resistance available. Otherwise, he wouldn't have um, he. I, you know, I think he clearly posits different levels of existence. You know, I think he, uh, I mean, I have a chapters in what I consider to be resistance in, in uh, to modernity in McCarthy, and one comes through animals. Mm. There's an extraordinarily um, deep and thoughtful focus on, on the behaviour of animals and what's lost um, from that from our understanding of animals as they're used in a material and a, a factory farmed way. Um, the whole business of the wolves in the crossing is a, a great example of that. The wolves are this, uh, these kind of um, these avatars of a pre-human world mm. uh, in which, you know, in some ways, is, which is represented as, although brutal and bloody, somewhat paradisical. You know, mm. it's, uh, it's, the, it's the antidote. Um, again, I, you know, I've talked about how landscape is posited um, also as an antidote. Um, um, spirituality in this, in this numinous way is also posited as an antidote. Mm. 
Do you think? Do you think they could be they, those things could be described as sacred though? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think I, I think they're sacralized in McCarthy. Um, you know, I don't think I don't think we're obliged to take them on as such, but um, I think we're expected to understand that if not him as author, at least many of his characters have that understanding. Mm. Um, you know, at some points there's there's some fairly straightforward uh, Christian revelation. If you look at the end of the crossing and Billy Parr, you know, as far as as far as you know, the way in which I read that is that. He's, you know, he's had a, a Christian conversion at that point. Mm-hmm. Um, you talk about the, you know, he, McCarthy talks about the way he's visited by, um, you know, this uh, this man, this transcendent man in his dreams and dreams within those dreams. Um, but again, it's represented as so numinous and difficult to grasp. Um, you know, one can never formally assert that that's what's going on there. Mm. Do you think that's because because the characters might have been sort of somewhat possessed by the modern the modern way of being, and so they they don't really know how to approach it? Because it's it's interesting you mentioned that these these things become sacralized or they become sacred in McCarthy's yeah. work, but they're not sacred in the sense of being these sort of it seems to me at least these sort of wonders that you can approach because they're still quite vicious. They're still holding something which is completely their own from another time, and if you don't know how to approach it, it's just yeah. going to destroy you. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Yeah, I'd, I'd like that in, in relation to the wolves in particular. I think you know, which remain these these tremendous uh, atavistic forces of nature that um, that are almost impossible to understand. That have almost passed beyond our understanding as fellow creatures. I think that's really interesting. Um, and the other thing is that that McCarthy does. He will very often set up these things, as I've said about them. Billy Parham at the end of the crossing where he's having this kind of spiritual experience. But he wakes up under the bridge and having um, thought in the night that he'd seen this line of pilgrims going across the horizon. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it's tattered plastic on a fence, you know, and I think that's a wonderful um, metaphor for for disillusionment um, Mm -hmm. with uh, organised religion. Um, you know, and you go. But I mean, McCarthy's got no time for it. If you go back to uh, the beginning of Blood and Ready, and the first thing that Judge Holden does is totally humiliate a priest. Mm-hmm. You know, he does it in this hilarious fashion, where he, uh, you know, he, he accuses him of child molesting and um, and bestiality, and it's a, it's a brilliant scene. And I think that's what McCarthy thinks of organised religion. Like that. Mm-hmm. I love. I do love that scene. I've never yeah, seen, never hilarious. seen that man before in my life. <laughs> Great sort of horrible, horrible punchline to this horrible scene. You see, yeah. sort of the mimesis of the crowd as they they sort of, I know it's an, it's an it sort of encapsulates the whole novel going forward. Really, it just he sort yeah. of throws in the throws in the bait. They take it, and someone ends up. I think the priests end up hung or hanged. Yeah, like yeah, I think they kill him, don't they? In one way or another, they might hang him. But it's completely. <laughs> All for the judges, but the judge isn't even amused. That's the great thing. He just sort of walked away, and well, he <laughs> had to do it for some peculiar reason, yes. something to do for the time being. Mm. Although you know, if you if you you know if you're going to be if I'm going to be loyal to my own ideas here, I would say that um, what what Judge Holden's doing there is um, is taking down organised religion, just as the Enlightenment and modernity has done, has, mm. has replaced it. Um, with science and reason, um, and that's his that's his motivating force in that particular exchange, and that's maybe why he doesn't find it funny because it's part of his work. Mm. Do you think <laughs> perhaps that's this strange and frustrating teleology of McCarthy's work is that in in accepting that we're moving towards this world of science, this world of reason, this world of the Enlightenment and modernity, away from the mythic, away from organized religion, but and the, but the mythic is still sort of there in the background. But you, as you move through to these two sort of currents of science and reason, or science and the Enlightenment, they've got answers, but they haven't. They're answers that don't answer anything. So we've right. moved from phew, this prehistoric sort of strange time into something that we believe we can control. But actually, when you look at it from McCarthy's position, nothing, nothing has been answered at all. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And you know, I think that I think one of the great services he does is to expose that um, that that fantasy, that that myth that um, that somehow um, we're moving from one um, 
one point on an upward scale um, that is a, a better and healthier place than another. He doesn't, you know, that's unacceptable in any of his fiction, I think. Mm. And, and that, you know, that's useful. Do you think his his characters know they're in this dilemma between this old world and the new world? I think it depends on the characters, uh, to be honest. I think if you, if you look at... Um, you know, if you look at somebody who's kind of of a basic everyman, like the kid in Blood Meridian, the kid doesn't know what's going on except violence and survival. You know, there's a, there's a little bit uh, towards the end where he begins to understand um, the the absolutely irresistible terror of the judge, but beyond that, he doesn't get much further in intellectualising it. But then if you look at... Um, at Sartre and the way Sartre thinks and um, the opportunities he's given to speculate on his um, on his lot, then I think that's very different. I think um, I think the characters in um, all the in the Border trilogy also are a bit more evolved in this, without being able to see at all through to the the end point of any of this, or even even to think out the. Um, the more challenging aspects of its intellectual content because they're all uneducated. And mm. McCarthy doesn't very often give us a well-educated character, mm. except the judge, interestingly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'd be interested, I mean, you have this fairly um, clear vision of really what the judge represents as an avatar. I'd be interested of what you make of Anton Chigurh. In a bunch <laughs> yeah. of old men, is he almost yeah. a is he almost an unknowing foot soldier to to the same force? I think so. I think he's. Uh, I think he's a, a less intellectual judge. Holt. I think that's what you what you have there. You have a um, somebody who's interested in um, the pursuit of instrumental reason um, in order to gain um, appropriate ends. And you know, I think that's represented in his chosen method of killing, which is the bolt gun. You know, the um, the air powered um, bolt gun, which is the most efficient way he can think of to get the job done. And you know his thoughts about killing are, are always about that. He has a he has a means to an end. I mean that's where the title of my book comes from because the um, sheriff in No Country for Old Men says uh, um, there's a new world coming and there's a, a, a true and living prophet of destruction and I've seen him and he's referring to China uh, and mm -hmm. um, and, and he's that, he's prophesizing this modern world that you've we've been talking about. Yeah, I think this is another stage along the um, the the road towards this um, inevitable um, collapse. I think the sheriff in No Country for Old Man is is one of uh, McCarthy's most sympathetic characters. It's, it seems to me he's the one one of the ones that McCarthy likes the most, and maybe has something in common with. There's a kind of wistfulness for pre-modern days where um, you didn't have this terrifying level of technological development which allows the worst people to be worse still. There's a real element of that. And Chaik is the, the representative of the worst getting worse. So, you know, despite much probably writing to the contrary, you, you possibly see McCarthy as a very moral writer? <laughs> <laughs> Oh dear! Are you going to get me in trouble there, James? If I uh, if I answer that question um, the way I'm inclined to answer it, I I think um, I, I wouldn't say he's a moral writer. I think he's he's a writer uh, who maintains hope. I don't think you know he's uh, for all the darkness of his work. There isn't nihilism there. There's a there's a suspicion. Well, there's there's a there's a rational understanding that we don't have to go down the Judge Holt and Chigo route. There's mm. options available to us. It's not for McCarthy to tell us what those options are. Mm. I think he can tell us what we can potentially set against what's happening to us and the things that we can uh, use to support our resistance. But uh, whether that constitutes morality or not is a different question. <laughs> and I'm, I'm not sure it does. I think, you, you know, if you, if you look at the... The work overall, I don't think there's a, a specific moral impulse there. I think um, morality is almost irrelevant. Mm. Do you see an evolution thematically over his work? Maybe perhaps a shared a shared theme that might be somewhat connected to good, evil, or morality that does actually have at least some sense of evolution? Or do you think it's more a intensification of the same dialogue between 
you know, old nature and the modern? I think it gets more um, intellectually advanced and more complex. I don't know that it changes very much. I think I would have to come down on on that side of things. I think there's times when I think perhaps... McCarthy agrees with Judge Holden. Um, and one of the things that Judge Holden says that where I think that is where Holden talks about morality as a mechanism for the suppression of the strong by the weak. And and I do think there's part of uh, McCarthy which dislikes that kind of interference in the natural order of things. And, and I think from that perspective, there's an active rejection of morality as we understand it in terms of um, stepping into um, the course of events in order to elevate the weak over the strong. Mm. So I don't <laughs> it's it's tricky. But, I mean, just to, just to jump back to it, I mean, I'd be interested to see where you... So you, you basically think that this Holden-esque vision of the future is already an inevitable failure for McCarthy. And that's what we're seeing in the road. Yes, I do. I, th- I think I think it's I think he sees its triumph. And and you know, and I think I think the reason that you know, I've 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 said I think the reason that the road goes the way it goes is that he can't see it through. <laughs> you know, I think there's maybe there, you know, that's morality at the very end where he can't quite bring himself to abandon us all to that um, very, very grim fate. Um, but um, I don't, you know, I, I don't see that as a convincing redemption. No, because other than, other than those last couple of pages as that you were mentioning about the trout in the stream, which are very, very memorable and probably some of the best in the book, yeah. The rest of it is, is extremely disenchanted. And I don't want to call yeah. McCarthy's work disenchanted generally because most of it has this sort of dark little right. glimpses of, okay, well, that was a bit supernatural, that was a bit strange, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas The Road is this this final thing. I mean, do, in the sense that modernity possibly has won there, it's won in the sense that it's finally severed the cord between itself and that old mythic structure. Yeah, I think that's a great point, uh, James. I think it's a really good point. And it makes me think of, uh, of I think it, I think it's um, uh, Adorno again who talked about um, the Enlightenment as the disenchantment of the world, mm. uh, and I think that's his most kind of Adornian book, um, the road until you get to the very end. If we set that aside, um, uh, that, that that part where the the boy goes um, uh, to off to his rescue, then it's clearly. Um, where modernity and the Enlightenment have uh, destroyed the world, just as the Frankfurt School predicted that they were going to do, and um, arguably um, we're engaged in the business of right now. Uh, so uh, I, I, I agree with you with that. For that, I think I think it's almost like all the things that might redeem us have gone from that novel. You know, if you, if you're looking for the spiritual in there, however nebulous, hard to find, except at the end. Um, if you're looking for um, the way landscape might save us, well, there seems to be no coming back. Um, but there are no animals left. <laughs> All the things that existed in the Border Trilogy that um, were pot- potentially ways that we could redeem ourselves have gone in the road. Mm. Uh, and, and I think, um, yeah, I think he'd have seen it if he'd have seen it through. We could have, you know, the label nihilism might well have uh, <laughs> have applied. Do you think the the label nihilism does actually apply again? Because he, well, sort of does re-enter because it, he writes the road was it two thousand and nine? I think the road. Yeah, I think so. And yeah, then and then we, yeah. yeah, and then we have the passenger and Stella Maris, and it's right. almost like well, okay, this was written afterwards, but in this sort of McCarthyan vision of things, you're almost placing them. I mean, of course, whether or not it's the same world. It could be, it might not be, we don't know. But it's almost, when I was reading, it's almost like, well, McCarthy, we know McCarthy's written about this this end, yeah. as you've said, of the modernity. And so these characters seem self-knowing enough yeah. and, and we know that they're in that timeline in a way. So the, the nihilism is, this whole story doesn't really matter of these right. people because we know what's coming. Yeah, I think that's a really, really interesting point. And it's borne out by the chronology that a version of The Passenger has been sitting in the archive um, in San Marcos since, I think, 2001 or two. Oh, wow. um, 
before the road. Mm. Um, so I think that's a really interesting point you make and, um, and bears out what you're saying about the, the chronology of this. I mean, now I don't, I suspect that a lot of the um, stuff that we've talked about regarding physics and maths and the, the time of modernity wasn't in the passenger in that particular version because it came post Santa Fe in the revisions of the novel. But the fact is there it was. And uh, so, you know, you can see, um, I think that, I think that, Sometimes also, um, to your point again, um, people um, overlook the um, – um, sorry, I forgot, what's the screenplay? Um, Coun- counselor. Counselor, yeah. Uh, people sometimes bypass the counselor because I remember it coming out at the time and people couldn't even believe it was McCarthy that had written it. You know, <laughs> there was a reaction, you know, that, that this couldn't have come from a writer um, like McCarthy, but it's – it certainly did. It's got his fingerprints all over it, and mm. and if you look at the very end of that screenplay, there's this uh, this this device which is round the neck of a character, which is a slowly t- tightening, um, a slowly tightening metal cable with a motor on it, mm. um, you know, and it's ultimate. <laughs> The ultimate intention is that it'll sever the person's head, which it does at the end, you mm. know. And for me, we're right back there to the um, to, to technology and humanity and the one destroying the other in uh, this final symbolic moment. And I think, you know, I think that's, again, as bleak as anything that we've seen in uh, up to that point. So mm. it's not going away. But Mac- McCarthy always, I mean, that's quite humorous. McCarthy always approaches. I mean, some people would say McCarthy's not very funny. I think he's one of the funniest writers, especially yeah. especially Sutri, and not the passenger. Yeah. The passenger left me really. There was jokes in the passenger which I think he wrote to fall flat, and I thought this isn't funny at all. But yeah, um, but but he is. He does have a great humor, and I mean, what do you yeah. think the purpose is? There is a purpose to that humor. It seems a bit too human for him. Yeah, I, I do think uh, the purpose uh, there's purpose to that humour, and I, I, I think he's. Uh, I think like many of us, he can't help himself sometimes. I think, <laughs> <laughs> I think he's got. Um, I think he's a man that appreciates what's funny and, and wants to include what's funny as it's part of uh, it's a part of, of who we are. And uh, I don't want to attach too much significance to it, but again, the ability to to satirise, to ironise, to laugh. It's a way to denature some of these very serious um, things. You can you can mock a tyrant and um, cause him harm, in, you know, in a way that uh, you might not cause him harm by other means. And I think McCarthy's very conscious of that. Um, and I, you know, I I, I think it's I think you're particularly in the Appalachian novels. Some of it was hilarious. The the melons and. Uh, and uh, so forth, which we um, probably shouldn't go into too much detail about. But um, um, the whole business with Gene Harrigan and his mm. activities, there's there's a character there that I it seems to me is um, significantly there for his ability to be funny um, mm. and to be uh, a vehicle for McCarthy's sense of humour, and it really works. Mm. But I also think um, Harrogate's there as a kind of pre-industrial figure. You know, if you look at the things that Harrogate does in Sutri um, with tools and with um, the modern world, he uses them in their most basic fashion. You know, he takes the hood off a Ford um, a car from the scrap heap and turns it into a coracle. And, you know, he he tries to um, – he poisons bats with strychnine. You know, that, that's a beautiful juxtaposition of the of – the, Hosted of the industrial and the pre-industrial because he uses a slingshot to do it, and there's all kinds of examples there where you've got a um, there's a, a different kind of modernity that McCarthy's um, analysing in the Appalachian novels to that which he looks at after that, um, and if you go right back to the uh, to the Orchard Keeper. And uh, there's there's that the opening line of anything that McCarthy ever published is about. Um, a metal uh, about barbed wire growing into a tree. Mm. Uh, what and what McCarthy McCarthy gives the barbed wire the motive force, not the tree. Mm. He says barbed, barbed wire grows, and for me that's a key um, a key moment in the whole of his work, where you can see he sees the motive force of technology existing at either this very basic 
um, tool using level, or it's a very, very much more ramped up advanced technological level. And there's a distinct shift between the Appalachian and the Western novels. Mm. Do you think that's sort of a, a guide for a practical individual antidote against these things is to sort of inhabit the mind of um, Harry? <laughs> not, not completely, of course. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, to have that sort of non almost nonchalant bridge between the two and just to be able to to flirt with the mythic while using the best of technology i think that's really i think that's a great question um, i think i think he thinks that that's lost now i think i think he thinks that we can't even if we wanted to revert to that because technology is such that we we can no longer escape its clutches. Um, Harrogate could. He could live in a cave system under the town of Knoxville. Um, you know, uh, Sutri himself lived under a bridge. Many people did live without the benefits of modern technology in that novel. You don't... Those that try and do that in the later novels are uniformly crushed and destroyed mm. um, very quickly. If you think about Billy Parham's nomadic life, about um, the fate of John Grady Cole and, and all those characters in the Border Trilogy, they, they don't get to do that. Modernity won't let them do that. So mm. we're trapped. <laughs> we're trapped. Do you feel trapped by modernity? <laughs> Sometimes I do, James, like you. <laughs> mm. But I also like it the way that I think McCarthy likes it. You and I couldn't have this conversation without modernity. We wouldn't be in this position to to analyse ourselves in this way unless we had the tools to do so. Very true. Do you, do you feel that that enchantment, though, that deeper, deep time mythic enchantment is is truly gone? Do you think we can get back to that? I think McCarthy thinks we, it's available to us. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't think he sees it happening anytime um, soon. And I think, I think, and this is pure speculation mm -hmm. on not very much evidence, that one of the reasons that he went to physics and to the Santa Fe Institute was as, a, as another way to get to that kind of mm -hmm. mythical, to the enchanted. I think he sees that kind of rarefied level of science as a, as a potential way to, to engage again with that part of uh, themselves. And, sort of like, and that comes out, I think, in the passenger somewhat. Mm, sort of like pulling the mask off modernity and saying, well, look, if we, if we turn you up to the terminal speed, look at this mathematics. It's, what, <laughs> what is it if not mystical? That's a great way to put it, I think. Mm. And, you know, to go back to your point where there's only a few kind of uh, high priests of this mechanism, I think it's a very interesting parallel, one that I haven't fully worked out yet, but I think has I've got, a lot of, um, I've got a lot of room for thought. Mm. Is, is, there, is there another McCarthy book in the works from yourself then now with the passenger in <laughs> Stella Maris? I'm, I'm, well, you know, I probably wouldn't have read um, either of um, the books um, with so much care had I not been going to talk to you, James. So, um, it's kind of whetted my appetite again. You know, the, the parts of the conversation that um, that we've been having about um, how do you relate what's going on in those two books to, went, to what went before, what remains, what stays, where's modernity in those books, I think are really interesting questions. It might, it might, you know, if I can find a bit of time to put my thoughts together, I'd like to. Mm. What role, I mean, just, just briefly, I guess, what role do you think they play? I mean, do you, if there's a purpose for, because the, the purpose for McCarthy to write them is, I haven't unspooled it, not that I'm going to, but what do you think that might be? I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure either because I still haven't come to terms with um, the chronology. So because I know that, that I know about The Passenger being a, a, a book that was written before many of the others, then... You know how does how how does that? First of all, I've got to find a way to situate that. I think, and mm. um, then I've got to decide whether I think Stella Maris is um, is part of the same book, um, or or needs to be um, treated as a separate entity. And, and then I've I've got to I've got to find some way to place all that physics and mathematics. <laughs> and I don't know. Um, that's going to be straightforward, but. Um, but, you know, McCarthy's always looking um, for explanations, for ways to, to unlock the, the secrets and truths that I think he, he thinks are out there. Um, and uh, literature is a way to do it. Physics is a way to do it. Um, what happens if you put those two things together? Uh, I think we're in that kind of territory. Mm. 
Mm. What do you think? Well, I was interested actually by your comment that whether or not those two books should be taken together or not, because I had the feeling afterwards that I can see why they were split. I don't think right. they should be taken. I don't think they should be taken together. I mean, st- the passenger it didn't leave me dry, but I found it an extremely dry, very, very disenchanted, ex- uh, sort of kitchen sink modern book. Right. Um, and then with Stella Maris, almost somehow transformed the the banal conversations between her. You know, that could be the ultimate literary cliche, a book of <laughs> therapist conversations with some sort of genius. Yeah. But somehow it worked. But at the same time, because her motives were not really anything to do with the therapist, she was in control. It just went off at this strange angle. Yeah. But, I was, but I was very down for about a week after reading them, yeah. <laughs> yes. yeah it's not a cheerful read. No, no. That's sure. not at all. That's sure. mm. which, which book do you think, I mean, you know, this, this conversation around McCarthy, modernity, I'm going to assume you would say that Blood Meridian is the, the best for trying to get to grips with this combat which is happening between these two forces. I, I, I think so, yeah. I think that's where it, it reaches its uh, clearest um, its clearest representation, and, and I think it, uh, I think it's a, one of the, it's an extraordinarily vivid book. I think that's you know you've got somebody who's writing there whose whose um, intellectual ideas are, are matched by their skills and craft as a writer, and you get this remarkable, um, unique novel out of that collision. I think if you look at the earlier novels, it's been starting to happen. Um, but it doesn't quite um, it doesn't quite reach its its heights until that point. Mm. And you know, if, if uh, I think Sutri is in many ways almost an equal of that mm. of that novel, the kind of apotheosis of the of the Appalachian period and uh, McCarthy's understanding of that and the writing of that is. Um, I mean, it's extraordinary. There's nothing like it. You know, people say it's Faulknerian, but it's it takes Faulkner and moves it on for me. I always, I always felt that was a very lazy read. I mean, style, stylistically, I think you know, I could see why you'd say that, but it's yeah. a bit, it's a bit quick to the draw to say it's Faulknerian because it's, yeah, it's just too easy. I mean, when you look at what's that book called? Book, books are made of books with all the. McCarthy references. You realise he's drawing from peculiar, peculiar sources. Oh, definitely, so, yeah. Do I do I sense that Sutri is probably your personal favourite? Yeah, I love that book. You know, I go back to that. I listen to that on audio book sometimes, <laughs> just when I'm in the car because um, I enjoy its rhythms and the and I enjoy its. Um, it creates a world, a, a fabulous world that's gone, and I love books that do that anyway, just for aesthetic pleasure. Mm-hmm. Well. Um, yeah, I mean, unless there's anything you'd like to add about your your book that you feel is is key or you haven't covered. No, thank you, uh, James. I really appreciated you um, your kind words about that book. I do. Um, um, it's a, it's a book I enjoyed writing, and um, uh, I'm willing to stand by. <laughs> so, yeah, I'll be sure to put the the links for people who uh, perhaps wish to buy it in the description below, and hopefully we'll see uh, another book by yourself on McCarthy soon. Thank you very much, James. I appreciate it. It's been great to talk to you. Thanks very much.